take your Bible and turn to Luke 18. The Gospel of Luke chapter 18. As you're turning, let me express my gratitude again for the opportunity to return this year. Uh, thank you, Pastor Rod, for the kind words, for the great hospitality you and your wife have showed, uh, the welcome I've received from all of you, Pastor Doug, for the uh, work he did behind the scenes and all the communication with me and helping get the plane tickets and all that sort of thing. Thank you to everyone for being so hospitable. It's uh, very good to be back. I uh, love this church and I'm grateful. Uh, Dr. Bruce Ware sends his greetings as well. He's been here several times. My friend and colleague at Southern, I ran into him this week, told him I was coming. He said, be sure and send his greetings to you. Luke chapter 18, and, and uh, let me uh, acknowledge to you that the idea for this message came from one that I read by Jonathan Edwards uh, from Job chapter 27. We'll look at also in a few minutes, Job chapter 27, verse 10, if you want to read uh, Edwards' better thoughts on this. But uh, this is where the original idea came for, for this message. The most harsh word that Jesus consistently used for his enemies, the Pharisees, was the word hypocrite. And even today, it's still about the most spiritually insulting description someone who, uh, of someone who professes to be a Christian. Now, on the one hand, every Christian is a hypocrite. I am a hypocrite. The best Christian in the world is a hypocrite. The church is the only organization in the world where you have to admit you're a hypocrite to get in. All of us know to do more than we actually do, right? We're all educated beyond our obedience. But on the other hand, many hypocrites are not Christians at all, though they think they are. Now, while we may wonder about this person or that, the most important inquiry we need to make about hypocrites concerns ourselves. In fact, it may be a mark of a hypocrite that when they hear about hypocrisy, they think more about others than wonder about themselves. How can we know if we are unconverted hypocrites? Because the danger is that the hypocrite may do many things which appear to be the fruit of genuine faith. But I want to talk this morning about the one thing a hypocrite will not do. Let's begin in Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8. <clears throat> now he, Jesus, was telling them a parable to show them that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, There was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God, and did not respect man. And there was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him, saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. And for a while he was unwilling. But afterward he said to himself, Even though I do not fear God and respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection, lest by continually coming she wear me out. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now shall not God bring about justice for his elect, and who, who cry to him day and night, and will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them speedily. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? Yes, of course he will find faith. He has promised that he will build his church. He will always have a people. Rather, what he means is, will he find this kind of faith, that is, the kind of faith that persistently prays like this woman? One thing the hypocrite will not do is persistently pray in private. Many hypocrites, of course, will pray in public. There are many who will pray in a church worship service if called upon, or in a prayer meeting, or in a small group who will not pray privately. And I've quoted several times this weekend, Jonathan Edwards, considered by one edition of the Encyclopedia Britannica, the greatest mind America has ever produced, pastored in Northampton, Massachusetts in the first half of the 1700s. He's one of the chief uh, uh, 
instruments in the greatest awakening this country has experienced and preached the most famous sermon in American history, said some hypocrites will pray persistently in private for a while, but not after the first flush of the emotional experience they believe to be conversion wears off. If you have not a spirit to love God above your dearest earthly friends and your most pleasant earthly enjoyments, the scriptures are very plain and full in it that you are not true Christians. An old Baptist writer of about the same time said this, A hypocrite does not and cannot call upon God in a sincere and spiritual manner, nor is he con constant in this work, but he prays only by fits and starts when it is in his worldly interest and external honor to do so. People see him pray. Consider him righteous. The Old Testament hero Job also said that what the hypocrite will not do is pray. In Job 27, verses 7 to 10, we read, May my enemy be as the wicked. Listen to the description of this person here. May my enemy be as the wicked and my opponent as the unjust. For what is the hope of the godless? When he's cut off, when God requires his life, will God hear his cry? When distress comes upon him, will he take delight in the Almighty? Will he call on God at all times? Not just when it's in his external interest and honor to be seen praying, to be known as someone who prays. It would be dishonorable to refuse to pray if called on in public. And he'll pray when life crashes in. But will he pray at all times? Job refers to this man as an enemy. In verse 8, uh, in verse 7, the wicked, he's unjust. Verse 8, he's referred to as the godless. And the King James and New King James versions of the Bible use the word hypocrite there instead of godless. And of course the hypocrite is a godless Man, for no true hypocrite, like the Pharisees in Jesus' day, regardless of what they say about knowing and, and loving God, do know God. And many, perhaps most, godless people are hypocrites. So hypocrites, true hypocrites, are godless, whether they realize it or not. And godless people, who would even say they are, are hypocrites in the sense that many of them will make some pretense of religion sometimes, they will sometimes pray and admit that they do. So what I want to refer to here is, is the godless or the people who are hypocrites. They have a religious veneer perhaps, but underneath there is no God, no love for God, no delight in God. They may make an outward appearance of religion, but they are hypocrites. They've convinced themselves, and maybe others are right with God, but in reality they don't know God at all. And the evidence of their godlessness, despite all the religious veneer, the public presentation of Christianity, is that they will not call on God at all times. Notice again what Job says there in verse 10. Will he take delight in the Almighty? Will he call on God at all times? Because that's what those who delight in God do. He's so delightful. They find him so delightful, they call on him at all times. The old Puritan commentator, many of you would have his commentary in, his, in your home. Matthew Henry wrote on this verse, The wicked will call upon God when it is in fashion, or while the pang of devotion lasts, but leave it off when they fall into other company, when they're not around the church and other Christians, or when the hot fit is over. In other words, after the emotion of an experience is gone. The reason why hypocrites do not persevere in religion is because they have no pleasure in it. They don't take delight in God. They, those that do not delight in the Almighty will not always call upon Him. In other words, regardless of all else that a person may know and do, if they are not characterized by persistent prayer in private, the Bible says they're hypocrites. For what the hypocrite will not do is willingly consistently pray in private. Now, 
Of course, many of us can think of people who really don't give any biblical evidence of salvation, but who nevertheless in some way pray persistently. There are millions of people in the world who've never really heard of the gospel of Jesus Christ, but who come to church of some sort almost every day. Or maybe they live in some cloistered community where they say prayers every day. They may pray and a meal every day, so it's persistent in that sense. But they don't pray humbly. They don't pray in private. We see in the next paragraph of Luke 18 that the hypocrite will not pray humbly. Look in verse 9 and following there. Luke 18, verse 9. And he also told this parable to certain ones who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and viewed others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax gatherer. The Pharisee stood and was praying thus to himself, God, I thank thee, I thank you, I'm not like other people, swindlers, unjust, adulterers, or even like this IRS man over here, this tax gatherer, I fast twice a week. I pay tithes. All that I get. But the tax gatherer, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift up his eyes to heaven, but was beating his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, sinner. I tell you, Jesus said, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now, the main lesson in this parable is that only those who humbly trust in God will be declared by God to be right with God. Not those who trust in their own righteousness, as stringent as it may be, fasting twice a week, praying in public, giving tithes, all of those things... We're not wrong to do. But this man trusted in those things, things that he himself did to impress God enough that God would open the door of heaven. And Jesus said, that is not the way to heaven. But rather, it is humility trusting in God to receive you because of what he has done, because of who, what he is, because of himself, not because of what you have done. That's the main teaching in this passage, but Jesus communicates that truth in the context of a parable about prayer. And one of the things he teaches us here about prayer is that the prayers God hears are those offered in humble dependence upon Him. The first example in this parable is the Pharisee. Now, as hard as it is for us to believe, because if you've been in church for any time, you, you know that the Pharisees are the guys in the black hats in all the stories. Jesus wears the white hat. The Pharisees are always the bad guys. They always wear the black hats. But in Jesus' day, whenever Jesus told a story about Pharisees, people would have wanted to identify with the, with the Pharisees. The Pharisees were considered the paragons of piety in their day. Most people would look at the Pharisees and say, I wish I could be like them. They are certainly going to be right with God, but I... I, I have to do my job, and I can't devote myself to the things that they do, and they are full-time impressing God. And so everyone would have thought that they were the righteous ones, and when Jesus said in verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other one, everyone would have gasped. They would have just been astonished that the most despised man in their culture, the, the, the drug dealer of their culture, the tax gatherer who colluded with the Romans to help take money from fellow Jews, the, the scum of the earth as far as the Jews were concerned, that God would accept him and not the righteous Pharisee, this would have been jaw-dropping to the people who heard Jesus.
anyone is right with God, it was these scrupulous Pharisees, they thought. He was trusting in his own righteousness, but he was wearing a mask of piety because inwardly Jesus says these men were full of death. And like many hypocrites today, these Pharisees knew the Scriptures well in the original language. Some had memorized the first five books of our Bible, the first five books of Moses. They knew them by heart, but they didn't persistently and with humility pray in private. So Jesus said, you're hypocrites, despite all those things that you know about the Bible. They knew their religious history well. They were not only familiar with the history of their own people in Scripture, but with the oral traditions of their ancestors as well. But they did not persistently and with humility pray in private. And Jesus said, you're hypocrites. They knew theology extremely well, always discussing it, and able to quote one rabbi and theologian versus another, and these various positions they could discuss. But because they didn't persistently and with humility pray in private, Jesus said, you're hypocrites. They were evangelistic and missions-minded. Jesus said in Matthew 23, 15, you travel about on sea and land to make one proselyte, but... They didn't persistently and with humility pray in private. So Jesus said, you're hypocrites. You're not right with God. They were stringent in their ethics. Despite their notorious inconsistencies, they tithed. Jesus said in another place, even herbs in their garden and seeds out of them. I mean, they were scrupulous. We're supposed to tithe everything here, 10 seeds. Well, one of those goes to God. But regardless of how they appeared to strain to impress God and obey God, the Lord said, because you don't persistently and with humility pray in private, you're hypocrites. You're not right with God. Many of them were obviously great teachers. They taught the people the Word of God, and they were, had the courage to debate the man who spoke like no man ever spoke. And some of them, like Gamaliel, attracted faithful disciples to themselves, like Saul of Tarsus, who would become our Apostle Paul later. And they were such effective uh, teachers that all the people listened to them. They were religious educators par excellence. But Jesus said, despite all of this, since they didn't persistently with humility pray in private, they were hypocrites. Some of the Pharisees would have had roles in the leading of the public praises, and doubtless many of them would have been skilled in music. But they didn't persistently and with humility pray in private because they were hypocrites. They were great scholars, but they were not great prayers. And it's possible to be both. The Apostle Paul was a Pharisee, but also at one time a Pharisee, but a great true man of prayer like Luther and Calvin and Edwards. The best thinkers can be the best prayers, but not these Pharisees because they were hypocrites. The Pharisees were faithfully committed to all the public religious expectations. They were in attendance at the public worship services. They had all the appearances of righteous people. They had the involvement in the religious community, the giving, the praying in public. They did it all. But there's one thing they would not do. They wouldn't persistently and with humility pray in private. And it's because of that, despite all else that they did, Jesus said, that's the mark of a hypocrite. A true hypocrite can do almost everything a true believer can do. But there's one thing the hypocrite cannot do that the true believer does. Persistently and with humility pray in private. Notice the man who did, verse 13. He prayed standing some distance away. He, he, reflecting his humility, would not come close to the place where people would normally pray as the Pharisee did. He was unwilling even to lift up his eyes to heaven, which is the way most would have prayed in those days. But in humility, he had his head bowed before God. He was beating his breast, the sense of self-condemnation, this awareness of this sin factory that beat in his chest. And he realized that that condemned him before God. And despite any outward displays of obedience or righteousness within him, there was this, this poison, 
and it made him guilty before God, and nothing he could do could erase that. And all these marks of humility and dependence upon God, praying not in his own righteousness, but with humility, Jesus said, that's the man that was acceptable to God. He knew that he could not impress God with anything that he did, outwardly or inwardly. And he depended upon God to accept him by grace. That's the man Jesus said. God accepted. But why is it? Why is it that the one thing the hypocrite will not do is persistently and humbly pray in private? There's three, three reasons why. Number one, they lose heart. They grow weary of prayer. Look back in verse 1 in this chapter. Now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart. Now sometimes that happens to every true Christian. Even the best men and women of prayer get discouraged. And prayer becomes difficult. But the hypocrite has no heart for prayer and grows weary in it because he's weary of God. In Isaiah 43, verse 22, the Lord condemned those who claimed to be his people, but who did not really love and serve him. He said, yet you have not called upon me, O Jacob, but you have become weary of me, O Israel. They did not pray. They didn't call upon God because they were weary of God. The hypocrite finds prayer just to be an empty discipline, a lifeless activity. And coming to God in prayer never refreshes them. It's only a duty. It only makes them tired. But it's because actually they're tired of God. But a second reason why the hypocrite cannot persistently pray in private is they're not justified. In verse 14, Jesus says of the humble tax collector, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. The hypocrite was not justified, not declared righteous by God, not right with God despite thinking that he was because he wasn't justified by God. He had not been given the Holy Spirit, which is given to all those God declares righteous. This alien presence from heaven, this second person living in your body, the person of the Holy Spirit that transforms everything, who brings his holy presence. And he is not passive when he indwells any flesh and blood creature. So this other person who lives in your body is not passive and he gives you new holy hungers. You didn't have before holy desires, holy aspirations, holy longings. It's inconceivable that the Holy Spirit of Almighty God would indwell any person and they'd be unchanged. But he begins to change them from the inside out. Their heart changes, their hungers change, their appetites, longings, affections, Jonathan Edwards would have said, the, the things that they, they actively move toward because they long for and love. Those who are justified, Paul tells the Galatian Christians, God sends forth the spirit of him, uh, of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So those indwelled by the Holy Spirit have this new fatherward orientation, this heavenward orientation. In other words, if you're indwelled by the Holy Spirit, you really want to pray. You want to pray. It's not just a duty. It's not just obligatory prayer that's bloodless and heartless. But it's communion with your heavenly Father. Not that you make yourself desire this you merely choose to do this the spirit of god causes us to do this if he is present he wants we he gives us a desire to communicate with our father so the person genuinely wants to pray listen to the description of the holy spirit in zechariah chapter 12 verse 10 God says, I will pour out on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the Spirit, capital S, the Spirit of grace and supplication. So the Spirit of God's grace is also described as a Spirit of supplication. So when you're given the Spirit of God's grace, you cry out, you supplicate, you pray, Abba, Father, you want to pray. You have a sincere desire to pray, even when you fail to Act on that desire. Even when you recognize your failings in prayer and your 
Your body is fatigued. As Jesus said, one place, the, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. You have a desire for prayer even when you can't make room for prayer at a certain time. Despite all the failings you have in prayer, despite all your inconsistencies, you want to pray. And despite all the unanswered prayer in your life, you can't not pray. Theologians refer to that as the preserving work of the Holy Spirit. That no matter how many prayers you have that are unanswered, no matter how difficult prayer becomes, I mean, the logical response to that would be, well, then just stop it. Good grief. Why keep beating yourself up? Just don't pray anymore. My goodness. Why are you torturing yourself like this? Just stop praying. Don't ever do it again. Well, anyone indwelled by the Holy Spirit would be horrified at such a, such a suggestion. No matter how few prayers are answered, no matter how unsatisfying prayer is sometimes, you can't imagine life without prayer. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, preserving us in prayer. That's that great illustration from the best-selling book in English in the history of the world, Pilgrim's Progress. Early on after the pilgrim's conversion, he goes into the interpreter's house, which is the Holy Spirit. And there are about six different scenes the interpreter shows him. In one of those, he comes into one room, and there's a fireplace, and the fire is blazing, and the devil keeps throwing water on the fire. And he's frustrated to death because he can't put the fire out. He dampens it down, but it comes right back up, and he's so frustrated. And then the interpreter takes him on the other side of the wall in the other room, and there's someone on the other side throwing oil, keeps throwing oil on the fire. And that's the Holy Spirit, that no matter how much the world, the flesh, or the devil dampen our prayer life, the Holy Spirit is always causing us to cry, Abba, Father. We can't not pray. And though there are seasons of faithfulness and of prayerlessness, those troughs can't last very long. No matter how weary, no matter how frustrated in prayer, no matter how discouraged, no matter how few prayers are answered, you can't go very long and not pray. That's the work, the preserving work of the Holy Spirit in those who are justified. That is not the experience of the hypocrite. He doesn't persistently and with humility pray in private because he's not right with God and has no desire to spend time with God. But here's the third reason why the hypocrite will not persistently and with humility pray in private is his greatest delight is not in the Almighty. We're back to Job 27.10, who said, Will he take delight in the Almighty? Will he call on God at all times? He doesn't call on God at all times because he doesn't delight in God. God is not the greatest delight of his life. God is a duty. God is a taskmaster. God is an obligation. Not a delight, the greatest delight. And though a hypocrite may pray in private when in trouble, in general his life is not characterized by persistent private prayer because he doesn't delight in God. He loves his work, his money, his family, his hobbies, his goals, sex, the Super Bowl, other things more than God. He wouldn't deny God. He wouldn't say he doesn't love God, but the reality is he does. And one of the indications of that is that he does not persistently and with humility pray in private. Something else delights and exhilarates him more than God. He cannot see God as the most enthralling being in the universe. He's blind to that. He's blind to the beauty of God. He's never been astonished by the glory of God, he does not, as Job say, take delight in the Almighty. God is a duty. God is an obligation, not a delight. He does not take delight in the Almighty, unless we forget who is the Almighty. Jesus said in Revelation 1.8, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God who was who is, who was, and who is to come, the Almighty. Jesus Christ is the Almighty God. And ultimately it boils down to this, the hypocrite does not want to pray because he does not know, he does not love Jesus. So obviously the conclusion of this is the question, are you a hypocrite? There are two types of hypocrites. First, there is the contented hypocrite. 
This is like the Pharisee. The contented hypocrite, without the grace of God, without the Spirit of God, wants no more prayer. They can be content for the rest of their life if they never prayed more than they do now. In fact, secretly, if they knew they could go to heaven and would never ever have to pray again, they'd be very happy with that. They can be quite content without praying in private. Well, my friend, if you're a contented hypocrite, there's nothing I can do for you. All I can do is show you Jesus. I can't show you how to delight in Jesus. I can only show him to you as delightful. I can't show you how to delight in a sunset. I can point you to the sunset, but if you don't see it as delightful, I can't give you steps in how to delight in a sunset. You either see it as delightful or you don't. And it's the same way. You either find Jesus delightful or you don't. If you don't, it's because you haven't been given spiritual eyes to see. And I can't give them to you. Only God can do that. And if by His grace He gives you a sense of desperation to know Him and to see Jesus as beautiful and delightful for who He really is, then call upon Him. Ask Him to change your heart and to give you new eyes. But if you're contented to be a hypocrite, if you're contented to never pray more than you are now, I can do nothing for you but point you to Jesus. But the other kind of hypocrite is the discontented hypocrite, and this person is a Christian. Remember we said in one sense, every Christian is a hypocrite. In Galatians 2.13, in fact, the Apostle Paul recounts a time where he called both Peter and Barnabas hypocrites. And he did so because at the time they were not living as Christians in a particular circumstance. And they were persisting in that. They were not acting like Christians when they were around certain Jews. So if Peter and Barnabas can sometimes act like hypocrites, so can the rest of us. But the Christian who is a hypocrite is not content to be without private prayer. You're grieved by the lack of prayer. And it's not just a guilty conscience. It's not just, oh, I know I should pray more. And, you know, I'm just not making time for it. So I know I feel guilty about it. No, I'm not talking about that. You're grieved by the lack of prayer because you're grieved by lack of communion with God. It's because you know what you're missing not because you're failing in an obligation. You genuinely grieve over a lack of communion with God. You, you long for more intimacy with God. And that's what grieves you, that you're not experiencing more, that you hate the busyness that keeps you from prayer. You're frustrated over the lack of spiritual discipline or over the, the sloth because you know what you're missing. You, you know you're a hypocrite and you can't stand it. The contented hypocrite is content to be without any more prayer than they're experiencing right now. The discontented hypocrite says, I can't stand it. The true Christian can have times, for sure, where they're not happy in prayer. But they're even less happy in prayerlessness. They may not be happy with their prayer life, but they're even more unhappy when they don't pray. They know they're missing something. What you're missing is communion with God. Prayer is the way we experience God. And there's, there's no greater experience than experiencing God. He is your life. And when you're not praying, you're, you're, you know you're missing life. If you're not then a true hypocrite, then live as you were meant to live. As Paul put it in Colossians 4.2, devote yourself to prayer. One writer said this, do we want any stronger evidence of the perpetual Christian's tendency to spiritual declension than this? In other words, he says, every Christian, though the Spirit of God draws us Godward, Abba, Father, draws us heavenward, that's, that's the new nature. That's a Christian who 
And that, that's a person who wasn't drawn heavenward like this before. That's evidence of the Holy Spirit in a new nature. There's still something within us called the flesh, which like gravity also in this world continues to pull us away from God. The susceptibility to temptation, the fact that temptation has any effect on us whatsoever is indicative of the flesh. And that, like gravity, is always pulling us down in what he calls spiritual declension. He said, you know, the greatest evidence of this is that the child of God requires repeated stimulus to the sweet and precious privilege of communion with his heavenly father. In other words, it's like saying, look, Jesus himself bodily is in the fellowship hall. And you may go see him. Wouldn't it be crazy if you didn't want to? You profess to be a Christian? And that's basically what he's saying. Prayer is the way we experience God, and yet we have to constantly be stimulated to go to him. That we need repeated stimulus to the sweet and precious privileges, privilege of communion with our Heavenly Father. That he needs to be urged by the strongest arguments and the most persuasive motives to avail himself of the most costly and glorious privilege this side of glory. Does it not seem like pleading with a man to live? Reminding him that he must breathe if he would maintain life? Just indicative that even born-again people with the Spirit of God the, the impact, the influence, nevertheless, of the flesh in this life, the tendency, the natural tendency we still have away from God. And that's why we need to be under the preaching of the Word of God so regularly. We need to read it on our own individually. We need to be around the people of God who, who encourage us in the things of God. So you want to live? You want to really live? Pray. Look to Christ. In prayer, look to Christ for forgiveness. In prayer, look to Christ for hope. In prayer, look to Christ for acceptance with God. In prayer, look to God for direction. Look to God through Christ. Look to Christ. Look to Christ. Let's pray. Father, it's just maddening when we realize the great privilege you give us in prayer, and yet we find so many distractions that keep us, keep us from prayer. Oh, it only testifies how desperately dependent we are upon you for our salvation. It's, it's not as though once we accept Christ, well, now we can handle this on our own. If your spirit does not preserve us, we are constantly being pulled away from you. The world, the flesh, the devil are powerful adversaries. We thank you for the Holy Spirit. Oh, if we could lose our salvation, we would. Oh, we would. But we thank you that you love us enough not only to bring us to yourself, but to keep us, to preserve us. Lord, keep us faithful. We're prone to wonder. Lord, we feel it. Prone to leave the one we love. Lord, by your grace, the one who saved us, may you keep us faithful and never let the Spirit's promptings be dampened in our hearts. I pray for all your people here today that this will only inflame their love for Christ, not condemn a guilty conscience, but only sweetly wound us in the sense of what we're missing. And draw us to your beauty and glory. And I pray that you would awaken some of those who came in today as contented hypocrites. Awaken them to their danger. Awaken them to their foolishness. Oh Lord, make them see Jesus as irresistibly beautiful as never before in their hearts by the eyes of faith. May they see Jesus as everything. May they see him as irresistibly beautiful and want to run in their hearts to Jesus. May we all do that. We pray in Jesus' name and for your glory. Amen.